Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> Third day in a row that I slept all night long and it was fantastic. Let me just tell you, I slept like 12 hours, you guys. I don't know what is going on. I must just need to sleep or something. I still sound like I'm half asleep. Takes me a good hour and a half every morning, plus uh, getting my coffee <laughs> rolling before I sound pretty normal. But I needed to get on the road and uh, start vlogging because I have a hair appointment at 3.15 today. And I have a bunch of other things that I wanted to do. So, here we are. How are you? I swore last night I was going to vlog. I swore. I was like... Not gonna lay down. <laughs> I don't even know what happened. I, um, so Alex ate a late, like, late lunch, early dinner. Well, late lunch, late dinner, kind of because he worked late last night. And he got chicken fingers from this place. And, um, so he wasn't hungry. Melissa and Jason wanted to go to dinner, so I was kind of waiting to see. And, um, but Alex then said that he didn't want to go to dinner, so I went and got Burger King last night. <laughs> Such a fine, fine meal, isn't it? And I sat there and I watched Welcome to Plathville, and it was actually really enjoyable. And that was when Alex got home. And Alex laid in bed and played, um, his game, Township. So when I got done eating, it was like 9.30, something like, like 9.30.10. And I was just gonna leave right then and go vlog because I really wanted to listen to a lot of my audiobook because the last three days, I haven't listened to my audiobook really at all. And I was like, okay. <clears throat> now I was cutting it close, trying to get to 100 books as it was. And I haven't listened to any books in three days. Like this, I'm making it almost impossible on myself, right? So I was like, I'm gonna go tonight and I'm just gonna listen to this entire book tonight after I get done vlogging. But I started getting so tired. So I was like, I'm just gonna lay down for a little bit. And Alex had the lights on and I turned my side off. And I said, do you mind turning your side of the light off? And he turned it off and I was so cozy, you guys. I was out. I was out and um, I set an alarm, but I don't remember the alarm going off or anything. I must have just shut it off and said enough of that. So anyway, I got a great night's sleep. Woke up, almost all the snow is melted, which is very sad. It doesn't look like Christmas anymore. I mean, there's still some snow on the ground, but it's not like how I like it. If I got it my way, I, we'd have two feet of snow outside. So, snow's almost melted, and then I have a hair appointment today, and I'm gonna vlog now, and then I'm gonna make, I'm going to get some coffee right now, and then I'm gonna go um, get uh, my hair cut. Is that what I said? No. Then I'm gonna run to the post office. I have been like meaning to go to the post office. I have packages to pick up. Um, I have had this yellow form to pick up something from the post office. They put this in my mail, my post office box. I picked this up like two weeks ago and I haven't been there to pick anything up really in a while. So I need to go there. I just don't want to stand in line. So I'm gonna go do that right now and see if maybe, since it's kind of early afternoon, if maybe it's uh, it's 128 right now, if maybe it's not um, too busy. But first, coffee. So I had a really fantastic sobriety birthday. Um, it really wasn't, like I mean, it's not like it's this like big deal, like you know, that I, uh, have some huge celebration or anything for it. But, whew, usually, I don't know, last year it would have fallen on maybe a Wednesday, I guess. No, it couldn't have. I wonder if last year it fell on a Tuesday. Because Tuesday, Tuesday's my home group night. And so, I usually get my coin on my home group night. So next week, I have to wait till Tuesday. Which Tanya can't go because, um, 
it's her wedding, it coincides with her wedding anniversary. So I talked to my sponsor yesterday. She called me, she was so sweet. And um, we're gonna, she's gonna give me my token next week and then we're gonna go out to dinner afterwards, which will be real fun. I thought it'd be kind of Christmassy because it'll be the 22nd, it'll be close to Christmas, you know, going out to dinner will be fun and, um, yeah, so, I don't know, I just, I got tons and tons of well wishes from people, you guys were so nice, thank you so much, um, it was, I just was blown away by so many people, you know, congratulating me and saying happy birthday and stuff, it was really, really nice, and, um, I made a video on my Peter Mon channel about, um, my main channel over there about addiction and recovery. And then, yeah, I just talked to a bunch of sober friends throughout the day and that was just about it. It wasn't like anything out of the ordinary. You know, usually I kind of feel like going out to some kind of dinner. Like Alex asked me, he was like, do you wanna like, you know, get some people together and go out to dinner? And, um, like some of my sober friends and him and stuff. And I just was really like last night I was, I was like, I'm going, you know, on Tuesday. I said, I don't need to do anything. I'm fine. But it was a good day. It was a really good day. What did she have all over her car? A little sticker that was supposed to be like Christmas lights. I just felt like, you know, I was just like, like last night in bed when Alex and I were laying there and he was playing this game, I was kind of talking to him and stuff about just how grateful I am for my life and all of that kind of stuff and, um, and all that kind of stuff, you know, and he was like, have you been real emotional today? And I was like, I have been real emotional today. I mean, I always am around my sobriety birthday, but and then kind of like the day that it's out, like it's over, I'm kind of like, it's like I made it through that. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense whatsoever. But, um, I was kind of like, real emotional yesterday. And thinking about things that I don't usually think about on my birthday. Like I don't usually go back to thinking a lot about like what could have happened, you know, if I hadn't stayed sober. Which was a lot of where I was at in my head yesterday. They have this raspberry drink up here. I'm not gonna get it, but I think it's so great that they keep these drinks up here. It's the special drinks that they have. It says order with or without espresso, all these drinks. I thought it said cider with or without something. I like an apple cider, sounds so good. I don't know why. <laughs> it's definitely a different feeling vlogging during the day than it is vlogging at night. It's called the Raspberry Chestnut Praline. I reviewed it on my review channel. Hi, welcome to Starbucks. Second out. Could I please get a uh, Venti? Iced blonde Americano with one Splenda, please. It's the iced blonde Americano with one Splenda. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Alrighty, that'll be 376 in the window. Alright, thank you. Thank you. I just loaded my Starbucks app so I know that I have money on there. Because yesterday I had like two dollars and something. It's water. Water! But there's definitely a different feeling about vlog. Oh my god, my battery is half full. Well, I brought two other batteries with me. Um, there's definitely a different feeling vlogging throughout the day than there is vlogging at night. And I know people are like, oh, I like the vlogs at night better. Trust me, I do too. Like when I vlog throughout the day, um, like it just, like throughout the day, it's like I, more stuff catches my eye and I'm like, oh, there's a red car and <laughs> that red car reminds me of, you know what I mean? Like I get like, I, I kind of forget what I'm talking about. Like at night, it's easier for me just to kind of like stream of consciousness stuff. Oh, 
I'm thirsty for my coffee though, I'll tell you that. I just cleaned out everything out of my car to be recycled. And now, I'm gonna throw another cup back there. I had like all these Diet Coke cans, and I had all of these um, Starbucks cups and stuff. I can't believe that I used to have so many points all the time. I used to have like almost a thousand points at Starbucks at any given time, and I have 178 points because I actually use my points now. I've been sleeping on my like like stomach again too because I like when I sleep on my stomach I do this with my fist. And my fist has been hurting really really bad again. I don't know why. Um, hey, how are you? Good. Good. And I don't know why that is. I mean, I'll be, that I like sleep so like with such a tight fist. Thank you. Have a good one. Sometimes the things that places do like confuse me. I don't really understand it. Like somebody else put my coffee over there and then <laughs> like, but they, like the window was wide open. They could have just like handed it to me. They looked right at me and like, like smiled and like put this cup there. But then they like waited for the other person. I guess the other person is the, the drink giver. <laughs> the drink giver. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it really matters, but I'm using my new pink cup today. This is the first time I've used this cup. This is my pink holiday cup. Don't you guys feel so honored that you get to be here while I'm using my pink cup? And then, Tani and I were gonna get a fountain pop last night, but she was so tired, or that was early, that we were gonna do that, but she was so tired from standing on her feet all day long working. Um, it's a nice cup, this is called a disco ball. You can see it looks like a disco ball. I have a pink one and I have an iridescent one too. I don't know why pink is a Christmas color, <laughs> it's kind of like a 50s Christmas color, I guess, right? Anyway, <clears throat> she was so tired, and I think she was feeling like... Kind of like, oh, you know, like, she didn't want to... It was my birthday, and whatever. And I said, Tanya, it's not that big of a deal. By the time I talked to her, Eric had ran out to go get her a fountain coat because she just wanted to sit at home and sit on the couch. I didn't blame her, she had worked all day long. And um, I feel bad for her sometimes. Like, you know, she stands on cement all day long. <laughs> Especially when it's like cold outside and they're, the dogs are outside and then they bring them inside. And... It's constant, you know? That place is always so loud. It's so much fun. I've spent so many hours at that dog kennel through the years. Tanya has to go over there every single night and like, you know, she gives the dogs treats and snacks every night. She lets them out and then um, for like 20 minutes and then she, you know, brings them back in and gives them water and all that kind of stuff, all the dogs. And so, um, she and Eric typical, she'll go over there sometimes by herself and do it, but if not, like Eric will go over there with her and help her. So a lot of the nights that I've gone over there with her, I've helped her with it, you know, through the years. And it's funny because, um, this one year, so the kennel goes like all the way out into the woods and there's like a backside to it. And she doesn't usually, unless she's like really full, she doesn't usually, um, 
put dogs out on that side, like the very back side. Um, and so one night, it was like in the winter and it was really cold outside and snowy and we walked around that side because I just need to make sure that the gates are locked over here. And so she went, we went around to that side and she was like, what's that sound? And I go, what sound? And she like put her um, flashlight up and there was like this raccoon that was hanging there and there was like a baby raccoon too and it was like, oh my God, we started running so hard. We were so scared. We thought we were gonna slip and fall on the ice and kill ourselves, oh my God. I was like, oh my God, Tanya, oh my God. We were like screaming and yelling and stuff. We just totally didn't expect that to be there and it was like hanging on the side. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we've had some fun times. Tani used to, uh, well she still does some of them, board the, um, the canine cop dogs. And so, like if we were like driving by something going on, like where you know there was like six police officers or something that pulled somebody over, Tanya would pull over. She'd say, pull over. I'd be like, no, Tanya. And she'd say, pull over. And so she would say, uh, you know, like, hey, you guys, it's Tanya from the kennel. I board the kennel. They'd be like, oh, hi, Tanya, how are you? And she'd say, fine, do you guys need any help with anything? Is everything okay? Because <laughs> she wanted to find out what was going on. Oh, man. I'm like, should I tell this story? Should I not tell a story? Okay, I can't tell the person's name, but, um, so it was a Tuesday night, and I know that because we were supposed to go to our meeting and we didn't end up going to our meeting. This is when I was with my ex. And, um, so Tanya called and she said, do you wanna go get a fountain pop? Uh, we didn't go to our meeting because there had been like all this snow. We had gotten like tons and tons of snow outside. And it was like, nobody was like out and whatever. And she called and she was like, do you want to go get a fountain pop? And I said, sure. So we went and got her and we were going to get a fountain pop and we drove by um, this, what do you call it? Um, parking lot where there was like a Joe's Grill and stuff in there. It was like where there was this Marsh grocery store, which doesn't exist anymore. And, um, you know, like this was after we had gotten our fountain pop and we were just kind of like driving around and stuff and it was she and my ex and I. And you know like we're like in the middle of parking lots, they'll like push snow up into these embankments and these like, you know, huge hills and stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like they'll push all the snow in the parking lot like into one big hill in the middle of it, you know? And they're like 10 feet high and stuff. Okay, we drive by and there is this like little like tracker. Do you remember those little tracker Jeeps? sitting like on top of one of those things. Like I don't even know how it got up there. Like this person just like ran up there and just like it sunk like that, you get it? <laughs> like like that, okay? And then it wasn't moving. So <clears throat> Tani goes, who drove their car up on that embankment like that? And so I'm looking and I go, I don't know. I go, but it looks like somebody's in the car. And she's like, no, that can't be. And so, we like look closer and we're like, oh my God, yeah, there is somebody in the car. So, Tanya goes, pull in there and make sure that they're okay. So, um, we pull in and we like pull up, like right next to her, like I was driving and then it was Tanya and my ex was in the back. And um, so we pull up right next to her and we're like, I'm like honking and stuff, right? Trying to get her attention. And she's just like this in her car. This woman looking straight ahead. Like she won't like look at us or anything, right? And so Tanya's like, well get out and see if she's okay. And I was like, you get out and see if she's okay. I don't want to get out. So anyway, they're all like, you get out, you get out. So I get out finally. And I knock on her passenger side window, right? And she just stays like this. Like, she acts like she doesn't hear me. I'm like, I'm like knocking loud, right? And she's just like this, sits up straight. Like she doesn't see me. 
So, <coughs> Tanya, I was like, I don't know what to do, you guys. So Tanya's like, go around to the driver's side. So I go around to the driver's side. I'm like, literally like this far away from her, right? I mean, she's just sitting there. And I'm like knocking on this window and she's just sitting here like this. So finally she reaches down and she cranks down the window, right? Oh, the battery is dying. Damn it. Well, I know I have a charged battery with me, so I have two. I have two batteries, I know one of them's charged. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Okay, hold on a second, let me pull in here. I'll change this battery. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So anyway, um, I'm knocking on this woman's, um, how should I go? Should I go that way or should I go this way? I'm knocking on this woman's window. Here we go. And um, she finally, she like, roll, she doesn't even look at me. She just like reaches down and like cranks open her window. And as soon as she did, I was like, Ooh, like the whole car smelled of alcohol. It was like somebody had just taken a bottle of like vodka and just like poured it like out, you know, like in the car. It just was like reeked of alcohol. And so I was like, I go, ma'am, I go, are you okay? And she was like, she wouldn't like really say anything to me. And then I was like, you're sitting on top of a snow embankment. And she goes, what? And I said, you are sitting on top of a snow embankment. And she wouldn't look at me. She just like kept her hands like on the steering wheel like this. And she was like, I was just trying to find a parking space. And I go, what? And I go, do you know where you're at? And she goes, yeah, I'm going to Joe's Grill. And I go, well, it's not open. And at this point it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I said, it's like everything's closed because of the snow. Well, what are you talking about? And I said, I said, everything's closed because of the snow. I said, why don't you come with us and we'll take you home? I, she goes, oh, I'm not coming with you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't really care, you know? And I'm like, are you sure? I said, because you're sitting on top of a snow bank. There's no way you're going to be able to get your car out of here. She goes, I'll just move my car. And she starts revving her car. And her car's like, vroom, vroom. and I'm like, oh, God, here we go. Okay. I'm like, she's literally sitting, like, but, like all four wheels in snow, you know, on top of, like, the snow pile. So, finally, I don't know what happened, but I was like, ma'am, I was like, your car is stuck. I was like, you're not going to be able to move your car. Joe's Grill is closed. I said, why don't you come with us? She was obviously extremely intoxicated. So, she was finally like, okay. But she was, like, real resistant about it. She's like, I don't know you. And I was like, no, and I don't know you. And I was like, but we're going to get you home. And so she was like, okay. And so, um, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so when we were driving there, Tanya was in the back seat. My ex was in the front seat because that's when we got there. Tanya was like, I'm not sitting in the back seat. I don't know her. And so Tanya, like, moved to sit in the front seat. She was like, she could be, like, a killer or something. I was like, Tanya! So, <clears throat> Tanya moves to the front seat. So, we're, like, driving, and I'm like, can you tell us where you live? And she was like, um, she was like, I'm not going to tell you guys where I live. And I was like, okay. And I, she's like, why would I tell you guys where I live? Why would I give you my address? And I'm like, because I'm trying to take you home. And I think at that point, Tanya was kind of doing most of the talking. And Tanya was like, don't you want us to take you home? And she was like, why? And she kept on like, she was like, why do you want to like know where I live or something? And I said, well, then why don't you just tell us where to drop you off? Like I was ready just to drop her off wherever at this point. And, um, cause this had now been quite some time. And not to mention that if like the police had come out there, she probably got, would have gotten arrested for drinking and driving. She would have gotten, you know, like whatever God knows. Oh, this is the other thing. She had pajama pants and flip flops on <clears throat> and just like some little t-shirt. She had no coat on or anything. She would have like, if she'd gotten out of that car, I mean, it would not have been good. It was freezing that night. And so, so finally she's like, well, you just keep driving and I'll tell you when to turn. And I'm like, okay, we can do that. So the whole time we're going over there, Tanya's like, <laughs> she said something to Tanya about, 
she like started opening up and kind of like trusting us and she was like yeah she was like I know I shouldn't have been out in the snow, but I just needed a drink. She's like, have you ever just needed a drink? And Tani was like, oh yeah, I've, I've been there, you know, like I relate. And she's like, no, you probably don't understand. And Tani was like, well, you wouldn't believe where we usually are on Tuesday nights, but we're usually out at a 12 step meeting. And she was like, really? And she was like, yeah. And Tani was like, we're alcoholics. <laughs> I was like, okay. And she was like, Oh, I tried those classes. Those classes don't work. And Tanya's like, did you ever have a sponsor? Did you ever try a four-step? Did you ever? I'm like, oh my God, Tanya. She was like, I did all that stuff they told me to do at those classes. Those classes don't work. I was like, okay, are we home yet? No. So finally, she tells us where to go, which is like real close to like where Tanya lives. And, um... So Tanya's like, I'm not going into her house. So my ex is like, I'll, so he's like so over it at this point. He's like, I'll take her inside her house and make sure that she's okay. So he takes her inside her house and he comes out and he's, there are just like bottles everywhere and it was real sad. And the neighbor across the street sees us pulling up and like trying to help. And so Tanya went and talked to the neighbor and said, hey, I just want to explain what the situation is. Oh, my ex left a note too and said, we brought you home he, and like, left all of our numbers. And then also said where her car was and she could find her car and um, she never called. I, I, I'm not never assumed that she would. But Tanya talked to the neighbor and was like, hey, just wanted to let you know that we found her and her car was like on top of us. She didn't say anything else about it. And although Tanya did say that the neighbor was like, kind of looked at her like, yeah, that woman's kind of like got some problems. But isn't that so sad? We always thought we'd kind of like see her in a meeting at some point, you know? I'm not going to say, well, she told us what her name is, obviously. I'm not going to say what her name is, but let's just say her name is Judy, because I always use Judy. When Tanya and I drive by her, her street now, we always go, hey, Judy. Hope you're okay, Judy. So many people out there suffering, you know? I feel like Tanya and I have had quite a bit of situations like that happen. Well, that was just kind of like a random one, but there's a thing that's called 12 step calls and 12 step calls are where like somebody will call the service line and they're really needing help or they'll call somebody in recovery and it's not so much like an intervention. Like an intervention is usually done by like a trained interventionist and usually interventionists aren't even in 12 step programs anyway. It's more of a treatment thing. But a 12 step call is like where you go and like maybe like somebody calls it like the 12 step hotline or whatever and they really want to get to a meeting or they want to go to treatment. And so you get a couple people together and you go. Um, I don't feel comfortable sharing those stories on here, but those are like, um, those are, Tanya and I had one that was, I would say like a life changing, like wake up call moment for both of us. Um, you know, you can kind of sometimes forget how really truly bad it gets. And, um, You know, unless I put myself in a situation like a bar or something at two o'clock in the morning, which I rarely do, I don't really see people drink like that heavily or on that level, you know? I just don't. Um, You know, it's crazy how many people reach out to me literally every day and share their stories with me. I mean, it's so miraculous that people feel comfortable enough to do that. And you know, there's so many really positive stories that people share with me. They'll say, you know, like, um, 
you know, I've been sober for this amount of time or that amount of time or, you know, a week or a day or 12 days or 18 months. I mean, it's just, it's so incredible to read all those messages and comments like on my videos and stuff like that. But at the same time, like I get so many comments from people, messages from people. These are typically more emails where people will say, um, I've even gotten a few cameos like this where people will share with me that like a spouse or a parent passed away from addiction. And um, it's kind of surprising to me, honestly, that I don't get more people um, because I feel like a lot with like opioid addiction, especially in our country, it's it's affecting a really like a younger generation. I'm surprised I don't get more people that tell me about their that they've had children that have passed from addiction. Um, because I would say that the majority of the people that I know that have passed from addiction are younger. Like, you know, I would say in their early to mid-twenties. Um, not all of them, but... I mean, because the reality is, like, opioid addicts just don't typically live to be, you know, a lot older unless they picked up when they were older. Um, I mean, it's a drug that takes you down pretty quickly. I just realized, I was like, I have to be, like, leaving for my hair appointment in less than an hour, and I'm just, like, out driving around. <laughs> Hello? Um. But I get so many messages and comments from people that are telling me about, you know, their family members that have passed away from addiction and it's so sad, you know? It's so tragic. And I think to myself, but for the grace of God, that could have been me, you know? Could have been my mom, too. I think my mom, it was so easy for her to kind of rationalize her drinking at times because, you know... I've talked about this on here before because this is going to be the name of my book. But at one point, my mom was very much what I called, like, the pretty drinker. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. She looked rough a lot from drinking. But the majority of the time, I mean, she was like, she had completed her daily functions. You know, she had daily functions. But, I mean, she had. She had, like, you know, especially when she was, like, older, you know. Like, you know, I was in high school or older, like, I mean, my mom was kind of like, she worked and then she came home and that, you know, she made herself a little dinner, lean cuisine, and that's when she started drinking, you know, and then she would have probably a glass of wine with dinner and then, you know, a couple glasses of wine after dinner and then a couple martinis and she could kind of rationalize it, I think, and she could say, you know, like, well, I worked today and I had my dinner and, you know, she was very, I mean, you think about that whole situation of like just being sitting there and like your dinner being, you know, two lean cuisines or a lean cuisine and getting excited about which lean cuisine you're having for the night and a glass of wine, you know, and a cigarette after dinner. I mean, like, that's a sad, lonely, depressing existence, you know? And I think the reality was that was my mom's existence for quite some time. And I and I don't know that it said I didn't know it. I don't think I cared. I was so into my own selfishness. I mean, there was a real part of me that time. by the time that I left high school, I felt like... I don't really talk a lot about this part on there or on my vlog hardly ever, but there was a part of me by the time that I left high school that very much felt like I have taken care of this woman for the last 12 years of my life. Like I'm done. Like I'm tired. Um, like I really did in some ways feel like the surrogate husband that was taking care of the household, even though I mean, I really wasn't, I kind of felt like that sometimes, you know, kind of like if my mom was scared, I had to make her not scared and I had to make sure that she was safe and she was in bed. And, you know, there was a lot of times I even poured down alcohol, you know, because I just was like, didn't want to have to worry about when I was gone. And, you know, it just, there was a lot of that. And so when I left and moved out when I was 18, I was, I done. I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not taking care of you anymore. Like, and there was probably a good, like, year in there at the beginning where I didn't see her a lot. Like, when I 
first like moved out like that year and a half like I just didn't really see my mom a whole lot I didn't make a point of going over there I didn't I didn't want to go over there I mean I was drinking a lot she was drinking a lot um I, I just felt she was constantly nagging me you know, and I just, I didn't want that relationship anymore. I wanted to be an adult. I wanted to be independent. I was going out a lot. Um, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I didn't want to be this kid anymore. And so I made that very, very clear, you know, um, I think her drinking got really bad around that point. I think she was really lonely. I think she realized my job um, as a mother is over. I think she was like, you know, I raised my kid and I did my job and now he is grown up and he's an adult and he doesn't need me anymore. And I think she was like, the post office is completely packed. And I think, well, I'm going to go down here and come back, and then I'm going to run in and at least see if I have any more of those yellow forms, because I have to pick them up eventually, or I don't, they send the send packages back. Um, God, I just don't want to go in there. Um, I, I think she just was desperately lonely. I think she was like, you know, I, my job is done. I don't know what to do, like, with my life anymore. Like, what do I do now, you know? Um. And that makes me sad, you know? But I do know that, like, that first month, six months that I got sober, I did not see my mom a whole lot because um, my counselor was very, very adamant about my counselor in treatment and my counselor that I had out of treatment. Although, he and I had an okay relationship. I don't know if I've told this on here, but at one time I was like in a session and he was like sleeping and I was done with that. Like he was holding up, I wish I had a piece of paper in here to show you how he was doing it, but he was holding up the pad, his like notepad. And I kind of like, I was telling this story and I kind of like moved around and he was like, his eyes were closed. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, seriously? <laughs> um, I don't think I quit right after that going, but I, it was soon after that. He was a good counselor. He told me a lot of things that I still believe in to this day. But... I remember, like, it was important to me to know, like... So, I got when I got out of treatment, I was, like, right in this relationship. And I remember he was, like, not for me, like, being in this relationship... And, like, I asked him a couple questions, and he would always be like, why do you need to know that? Which, in retrospect, I didn't need to know. But, like, I felt like I needed to know. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like he didn't want to, like, open up at all to me. And it was very, very professional environment. And other counselors I had seen. I don't know. Like, I think that's why, like, with this guy that Alex and I found... Oh, man, he was so fantastic. I wish he had never... I mean, we're so happy for him that he got, um, you know, the, his dream job. <laughs> Which was not counseling, by the way. And retired his program at such a young age. He was Alex... He's Alex's age. Um, but it just was like... He just was so fantastic to work with. I don't know. I, I felt so comfortable with him. And I think that that's so important, you know, when you're working with a counselor, that you have a counselor that you're really comfortable working with. I can't see the light because of the semi. Um, but yeah, I think like, you know, that six months before my mom got sober, I think was also like the hardest for her because I do know that she was... There were a couple times during that six months, several times that she had tried to go to meetings. Um, she later told me about it, and I actually read about it in one of her journals too, where she like went to a meeting and she like drove around this church and she just couldn't go inside. And she had done it a couple times. And in fact, at one point, like this guy had asked her, like she was like kind of like sitting outside the church where the meeting was, and he said, Can I help you? And she said, 
something like, yeah, I'm looking for the meeting. And he said, it's right inside. Do you want me? Like, you can walk in with me or something like that. And, and she said something like, no, I can't come in or something. And, um, like, my mom really had a hard time. And she actually, I've told this story before, she actually kind of came in through a different, to, through Al-Anon. Because a friend of hers was taking her to Al-Anon for me. And she was sitting in there and she was like, <sighs> people would be telling their stories about their spouses or their, you know, family members or whatever. Because Al-Anon's a 12-step program for friends and family members of alcoholics and addicts. And my mom was like, they're talking about me. Like, I'm in the wrong program. And, um... My mom was, like, legit the real deal. Like, when I still, like, to this day, like, I'll mention, like, something about my mom being sober. And people will come up to me and they'll be like, what was your mom's name? And, um... Because she used a different name in 12-step programs. And, I'll, and I tell them. And they're like, oh, my God. Like, I loved your mom. And they would be like, but she could talk. She sure could talk. My mom was a talker. You think I'm a talker? Oh, my God. My mom could talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. I miss that about her, though, you know? It's funny that those things that, like, sometimes drive you crazy about people are the things you miss about them the most. I could sit with my mom and talk and... You know, my mom and I would sit there and she'd make a pot of coffee and we drank a whole pot of coffee, just the two of us, and smoke cigarettes. And the whole time she'd say, I shouldn't be smoking in front of my son. This is horrible. And I'd say, oh, mom, but this is like, you know, this is when we were early sobriety and stuff. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know who I'm saying sorry to. But anyway, um, I'd be like, oh, but mom, we're having fun. And we would just sit there and we would have like the most deep conversations, drinking coffee and, um, you know, smoking cigarettes with a fire burning and she'd have all the candles burning and stuff like that. Somebody was asking me the other day, was it my sponsor? Who was I talking to about my mom smoking? Because they said something to me about how much my mom smoked at the end. And I said, you know, I said my mom would drive all over to find Mavericks. Because they were like the cheapest cigarette. And because I used to say to my mom, this is so horrible. I said, if you're going to smoke, you might as well be willing to put like spend the money to put something of quality in down in your body. Instead of those horrible Mavericks that will, you know because they're just really harsh. And she'd say, but they're so cheap. And so she would drive all over to buy a pack of Mavericks. But look, this is so strange. At the end, my mom would write the date that she bought the pack of cigarettes on the pack of cigarettes to see how long she could make it last. And she could make a pack of cigarettes last two weeks, 10, 20, you know, cigarette a day for 20 days. And I found a pack of cigarettes um, that had quite a few packs of cigarettes or ha had quite a few cigarettes in them left when she passed away. Um, or maybe it was just when she was in the hospital that I found them. I don't know, but it was, she kept them in this drawer and, um, like that's right off our living room. And she just had them in there with her lighter, like in the plastic part of it. And then she had written on the side of it, like, um, the date on there. And I was like, God, she really didn't smoke. I mean, she didn't smoke that much at all. But I would call her and I would be like, um, like I would call her late at night. I checked on in on my mom, you know, like every night. And I would say, hey mom, what's going on? And it would be like, well, if I called her, so my mom used to love to watch like the, the movie from like nine to 11. You know how they would do a movie every night, you know? Just on like the major station, she would watch all that. And then, and she loved to watch the show Scrubs. My mom was obsessed with the show Scrubs, which is so funny. Like, I don't even know where that came from. She just thought it was the funniest show ever. Oh, Will and Grace, too. I'm not a Will and Grace fan. And my mom absolutely loved Will and Grace. I mean, she would go on and on and on. She thought it was so funny. She was like, that Karen reminds me of your Aunt Kathy so much, my mom's sister. And she just loved, loved, loved Will and Grace. And she'd always say, doesn't, um, she was like, because, you know, my roommate that I lived with forever, she'd always say, um, 
That's who you guys remind me of is Will and Grace. And um, she'd say, although you're a little bit more like Jack, Peter, <laughs> is what she would say. But I would call her at like 11 o'clock thinking it was safe, you know, and because her show was over. And she'd say, I'm watching the evening news. She watched the evening news every night from 11 to 11.30, the local news. And she said, can I, she'd say, can I call you when I'm done? I'm smoking my evening cigarette. And she would literally wait until like the last half an hour of the movie. Or if it wasn't like a great movie, like the first 10 minutes of the news. And she would smoke her one cigarette for the day. And I said to my mom later, I said, why did you, and, the, and she had literally no medical complications from smoking either. And she had smoked since she was really, really young. And, um... And I said to her, because she always wanted to just quit. She'd like beat herself up and say, why don't I quit and whatever. And I'd say, well, if, you know, if I was down to one cigarette a day too, like you are like, what's the big deal about it? I mean, you're smoking one. Some days she wouldn't even smoke one cigarette. Well, apparently my dad had told her years ago, this is probably not even true, but anyway, something that's old statistic, that even if you kept, even if you smoked one cigarette a day, like it will, like it kept the like your lungs like dirty basically it didn't give them a chance to heal and clean like you had to quit smoking completely so even her just smoking one cigarette a day she still considered like so horrible she was never really a heavy cigarette she was never really a heavy smoker and she'd get mad because like when like we would go to the casino and stuff like that for like her birthday or like whatever if we just for a weekend I'd like buy her like a pack or two of cigarettes and I'd always buy her like uh, Marlboro Lights and like a box and she'd say, oh, don't, please don't buy me these expensive cigarettes. And I'm like, expensive cigarettes? Like seriously? What's funny is like when she was younger or when I, you know, like she didn't, she smoked Vantage with the holes in them forever because I used to steal them from her when I was in high school. And before that she smoked Kent's. So she must have smoked Vantage until the point that she started smoking. I don't, what am I even talking about with this? This is the stupidest video today. Until she started smoking. Um, people don't even really smoke today. You know what I mean? I feel like people vape a lot. I see people vape all the time. Um, you know, and the other thing is weird is like when I got sober, you could smoke in meetings. You can't smoke. I. I I don't know the last time I was at a meeting where you could smoke at a meeting. I can't even, I can't even think of one. I think some meetings that they have outside sometimes you can smoke at. Um, but I can't think of a meeting where you can actually smoke at a meeting anymore. I know like our home group meeting, you have to smoke like or vape. You can't even vape in the church. You have to smoke or vape um, after the meeting outside. And there's, like, an area for you to, like, put your cigarette butts and everything. And, like, you have to stand right there and vape. You can't, like, be, like, you know. But they're very serious about that. I think also, like, when I got sober, so many people smoked. There's, like, a funeral up here, I think. Is this, is this a funeral procession? It looks like a funeral procession. When I got, um... Yeah, people are, like, not knowing what to do. They're like, do we pull over? Do we, we pull over for a funeral procession? <laughs> um, that's sad. When I got sober, everybody, it seemed like that I knew, smoked cigarettes and drank coffee. Like, everybody. Then, there was this huge deal where, like, I mean, so many young people are getting sober, right? In the last, which is fantastic, which is absolutely fantastic. But so many young people are getting sober that you, it started to flip. And then, um, you know, like, like, people would ask me, they'd be like, well, people ask me all the time. They're like, do you sponsor people? Of course I sponsor people. I work a 12-step program. I mean, that's part of what you do, right? And so, you know, like, if I was, like, 
picking up somebody from like a halfway house, let's say, or something, right? And, um, you know, I was running into the gas station to get a coffee or whatever. I'd be like, do you want anything? They're always like, want monsters or something. You know what I mean? Like they always drink, like, which cracks me up. They're like, yeah, I'll have like a, a, a green apple monster. I'm like, what is that? You know? And I'm like, just come with me because I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, um, but yeah, it's like, and they always vape. They don't smoke cigarettes anymore. And that was like, I would say probably mm, five or 10 years ago, oh, five, uh, in the last five to 10 years. Now it's interesting, like Starbucks has changed things and it's like, I think it's, you know, well, I don't know. I went to a lot of like Skid Row meetings for a long time and when I did, like people obviously couldn't afford to have like coffee like that. But you would see, um, well, there was this one meeting that I went to and they like would bring like a lot of people from halfway houses there and they always, cause they could go to like to the gas station. Like I was just saying, you know, and, um, like pe like they would all drink like monsters and stuff like that. But that's because like I said, they were like 25, you know what I mean? They weren't like the camera died. Or it didn't die, but it was at the end. I don't even know where I was when it stopped. But I was talking about coffee at meetings and whatever. And I think there's been kind of like a resurgence. I think more people like are into like, I, I see more people drinking coffee. But I will tell you that what's interesting to me, especially with like the younger generation getting sober is a lot of younger people that are getting sober, like <clears throat> when I got sober and I was younger, and but it didn't like really matter if I was younger or older or whatever. Like, we got sober, and then, like, I mean, we drank a ton of coffee, and smoked a lot of cigarettes, and, you know, like, and went out to eat, and, I don't know, that just was kind of our life. Today, it's, like, a lot of, like, the younger generation, and I'm talking, like I said, like, mid-20s, get sober, and then they, like, right away, they, like quit drinking caffeine, quit smoking cigarettes, they like go start working out, they get real healthy like real quick. When I got sober, that was actually, actually like, I wouldn't say frowned upon, but you know, like they would suggest against it. They would say, well, you, you can't quit everything at the same time. So, you know, like be kind to yourself. And you know, if I had said, well, I want to like quit smoking and you know, quit drinking caffeine and I want to start working out seven days a week, they would have been like, oh no, 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 are you crazy? But now it's like this whole thing and like people are super, super healthy in recovery too, which I think is fantastic. I think it's great. Um, I wish I had caught that bug because I need to, <laughs> be getting really, really healthy as well, you know? Um, and be going to the gym and stuff like that all the time. But yeah, there's like a lot of people that I know that like go to the gym together. And t when Tanya was going to the gym quite regularly, um, she would bump into people, like three or four people from our home group. And um, so, I mean, yeah, I think that's kind of how it's different today. I think that's a huge way of people like restarting their lives, you know, is like, I got to turn around. This is the only place I can turn. I just realized I was like, I need to turn around if I'm going to make it to this hair appointment on time. But, um, I think people are getting sober and that they're realizing, you know, like I, this isn't just how I, it, it's just not about getting sober to me. It's that I want to have like this life beyond my wildest dreams. I want to have like, and that includes my health, which I think is fantastic. I wish I had, you know, I wish 26 years ago, and, there, and there's been a lot of periods, you know, in my sobriety where I have worked out and eaten really healthy and stuff like that. But, um, I don't know. I just wish I had gotten, like, super healthy and super into working out a long time ago. And it's not just the younger generation now, I would say. I, I think there's a lot of people that are, like, older, like my age that are getting sober. And it's just a different mindset, you know? Um, today, I think getting, and I'm just, I'm generalizing obviously, but I think it's a different mindset today, you know, than it was when I got sober. And I don't know, I think it, like a lot of the halfway houses and stuff like that, like the guys and the girls that are there together or whatever, I mean, they're, they're obviously not co-ed, but like 
the guys that are, you know, in a halfway house together, they all go work out together. And like the girls that are in a halfway house together, they go work out together and stuff like that. Like I've heard of a lot of that. And, um, like there's a couple halfway houses here in Indianapolis that actually have gyms in them, you know? So the guys will go to the gym and work out together. And, um, I mean, there's a camaraderie in that, right? And I think that's great. And it's about overall changing everything about yourself when you get sober. has been kind of all over the place today, hasn't it? I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't usually know what I'm talking about. I don't know much, but I know I love you. Do you guys want to know what song I'm completely addicted to right now? It is this Maroon 5 song. It's something about lovers. Hold on, it'll probably pull up if I pull up my... If I pull up my um, iTunes, because I've been listening to it nonstop. What Lovers Do by Maroon 5. Do you guys know that song? Oh my God, I love that song so much. Do you know that we saw Maroon 5 and we were in the second row and I have a picture of my hand going like that and Adam Levine is reaching out to my hand and we're like touching like that almost. You guys, I have to tell you, he is that sexy in person. He really, really is. I didn't really know much about Adam Levine before we went and saw him and we got these free tickets and this was actually the night that I was moving out of my office and my old office into my new office and I didn't want to do it that night. It's a long story. I've told it on here before because I was real emotional and I was like, no, this is an ending and I want to like just, you know, pay homage to my old office and all this kind of stuff. And Alex was like, we can pay homage later. Can we go to the concert first, please? And he was like, I really, really want to go. And I was just wanting to be sad, you know? And um, I was like, okay, I'll do this for Alex. We ended up having the best time ever. Oh my God, we had such a great time. This woman opened and she sang this song, Shark Out of Water. She was so good, and she was kind of like reggae ska a little bit, and I can't remember what her name was. It started with a V, I feel like. But anyway, and then Maroon 5 came out, and then it was at the Marat in Indianapolis, and we were literally in the second row, and, and I couldn't believe it. We used to do, on Fridays, we used to work with this radio station called Radio Now, and we would pick like the top three to five hottest things to do in Indianapolis for the weekend. Um, and we were part of the radio show on Friday. It was really, that was really fun. And um, we did that for a long time. And um, so we got like free tickets and stuff a lot from them. Like they would call us up and say like, do you wanna go to Jingle Jam? Or, you know, do you wanna do this? And we met a lot of people. Um, we got to meet a lot of people that way. So anyway, and um, also we got to like get really great tickets. Like they were really good to us. And so Alex really, really wanted to see Maroon 5. So, cause he loves Maroon 5. So we went and um, they were awesome. Like they were really, really good. But you guys, let me just tell you, Adam Levine, oh my God. He is so good looking in person. Like, I mean, I thought he was anyway, but I just kind of like, eh, whatever, celebrity, you know? Like, he is, like, no. Like, he is legit, like, super, super sexy. Well, listen, you guys, I am gonna get off here now. I got some phone calls I gotta make, and um, I've got to be home to start uploading this vlog so that I can go get my hair cut and then come back and do 15 things that I have to do today. So anyway, um, I'm gonna get off here now, and um, if you guys made it this far in the vlog, please put a Santa Claus or a Christmas tree in the comment section below for Christmas. And I love you guys, and I will see, I hope it's tonight. I hope tonight I vlog, not during the day tomorrow. Anyway, I love you guys, and I'll see you uh, tonight. Tonight, I promise. <laughs> Bye. Love ya. Love ya. Bye. Love ya.